We're picking up our lesson now on how to teach the Bible. What does the Bible say about teaching the Bible? After all, it's our rule. It's our guide. And so we shall look back at the scriptures again and see what it says about how to teach it to the classroom. We read in our text in Nehemiah 8 and verse 8 that they read the book of the law of God distinctly. They gave the sense and they called them to understand the reading. We talked lastly about causing someone to understand. When you teach, the whole objective is to get the student to understand the material that you're delivering. Not to be fancy, not to be uh, 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 outlandish, not to be so sophisticated, but does your pupil understand what you taught? That's the real judge of how you did as a teacher. We said that when you teach, you should teach in such a way that you put yourself into the pupil's shoes and you ask yourself, now what questions as a student would I ask? Would I ask how big was the ark? Would I ask where that window was? What I asked how the door got shut. What I asked was the ark sitting up on steel waiting for the water to lift it. What I asked how Noah rounded up all those animals. Try to anticipate the mind of who you're teaching, what questions they would ask. And if you can do that and write down, you know, now if I was the student, I would ask this. If I was the student, I'd want to know this. If you can write those questions down as you prepare your lesson, and then when you teach, answer them in the lesson, you'll go a long ways to really helping your students understand the Word of God. It's your job to cause that. Now, our next point is number four, how to understand the Word of God. As the teacher, you have to cause them to understand. You have to trigger the understanding. Now, we're not going to take away God's role in this, and we shall cover that in a moment. The burden is not solely upon the teacher, for the Holy Spirit will be doing their fair share, his fair share, but what I'm saying is you want to trigger a thought process. You want to so captivate their mind that they want to know, they want to absorb the material that you're giving. To understand has three definitions. To understand means this, to have an understanding or a comprehension of the topic. Number two, to achieve a, or grasp the nature or the significance or the explanation of something. And thirdly, to believe it to be true. Now, under this topic, you want to ask yourself this question, how can I apply this material to the student? Now, when you're teaching children versus an adult, you don't teach tithing the same to a child as you would to an adult. You would, an adult thinks in, in sums of, of much larger um, sums of money than does a child. A child thinks in nickels and quarters and dollars where the adults thinking in 20s and 50s and 100s. So when you get ready to teach tithing to a child, you want to ask yourself, now how can I apply this to a child? You wouldn't say, well, you're going to bring home, you know, $800. This you, you just skip that. What you'd say is now when you get your allowance, how much do you get for cleaning the house or taking out the trash? Okay, and then you teach them the 10th principle and show them how to figure out what their tithe is. When dealing with adults, it's completely different. You take it up on the adult level. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, to a child, that means one thing. To an adult, it means something totally different. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, to a child, that would mean if you love mom and dad, you want to obey them. You want to do what they say. Dad says, clean up your room. If you love mom and dad, honor them. Do what they say and clean up your room. Now, to an adult, it may mean something different. If you love me, keep my commandments. I mean, God commanded us to be witnesses and soul winners. For the adult, it may mean a, bunch, a much broader uh, definition. It may mean go visiting, go soul winning, give your tithe, give your labor at the church, do all that you can. Also, you have to remember this. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So in your teaching, you want to remember to rely upon the Lord to do the part you can't do. You're going to try to cause them to understand as best as you can. You're going to do your wholehearted best to make them understand the topic. But then we're also going to rely upon the Lord to do that which we cannot. And that's the spiritual part. Now the way a child trusts God, it's also different than the way an adult does. 
And if you were teaching that type of a principle, trust in God, for example, as we just taught the teachers to do. You would teach one thing to adults, a different to children. Now, there are some places where the way an adult learns and the way a child learns will be very similar, such as in giving the plan of salvation. I give the same plan of salvation to uh, six-year-olds that I'd give to 60-year-olds. I make it very simple about the matter of salvation, as simple as I can make it. But by way of illustrating and by way of causing someone to understand, you're going to have to take it to where your audience is to cause that to happen. Question number five that is asked then is this, how can I illustrate this? Now I think as far as, I think in terms of who my audience is, children, adults, youth, maybe just a men's group, maybe just a women's group, whoever, maybe your pastor teaching other preachers or missionaries, I have to ask myself then, how would they best get it if I illustrated it? What can I do to make it clearer to them? Now, almost in every Bible in the back, there are maps. In those maps, you will find, you know, the cities and the rivers and the, the, the countries that you're teaching about. And often you'll, uh, as you're teaching, you'll say, now turn in the back to the map of Paul's, you know, first missionary journey and let's see the places he went, you know, and you'll show to them those places. That's good. That's a, a means of illustration. One thing you want to be careful of, though, is to remember Publishers sometimes take liberties with the text that you wouldn't take as a Bible-believing pastor or teacher. For example, in all my years of teaching Sunday school and in all the age groups I have taught, every time we teach about the exodus from Egypt, I say, all right, everyone take your Bible and go to the back to where your maps are and find the map of the exodus of Egypt. They go and turn and find the exodus of Egypt. As they go out, the children of Israel leaving Egypt, and you'll see the little red line on the map showing where uh, the course by which they took as they left Egypt. You know one thing you'll find? I've only found one Bible exception to this in all my years. Only one person has ever produced a Bible that, and showed it to me and said, Pastor, look, I found a, a map that's correct. Almost 99.9% .9 of the Bibles ever found, when you flip to the map in the back, it shows the Exodus of the children of Israel leaving Egypt, going across land, and not across the Red Sea. Well, if we're a Bible believer, I tell you what we believe. We believe the children of Israel went through the Red Sea. That's what we believe, because that's what the text of God's Word says. Now, I want to say, illustrate it. But when you illustrate it, be sure you illustrate it correctly. You say, well, I didn't think there were errors in the Bible. There are no errors in the text of the King James Bible. The problem is, the publisher sometimes takes liberty with the text that he should not take. So be careful of that. Be careful when you're showing people maps, such as in a Bible or maps that are pre-drawn that come with some curriculum maybe you purchased. Be sure you talk through and you plot through the, the course or, or the look at where the cities are situated. Be sure they're correct before you present them to your audience. Um, some publishers, even in the text of a Bible, I know in John chapter 1, as I begin to I memorize John chapter 1, well, in John chapter 1, the words Elias and Isaiah show up. And I was having someone drill me. I said, here, take your Bible and let me quote John chapter 1 to you. I'm trying to memorize it. I need somebody to, to watch the text as I quote it to be sure I've got it word perfect. Well, I began to quote it, and I hit Isaiah, and they said, no, it, that should be uh, uh, Elijah. And I hit Isaiah, or uh, 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 they said, no, that's, that's Isaiah over here or something. I said, no, that's not right. I went back to my Bible, and my Bible and their Bible were different. The publisher had uh, taken the names and updated them. Well, one set's right, one set's wrong. I had memorized it, luckily, the right way in my Bible, somebody else's Bible. The publisher had switched the names. I would say this, make your own maps, make your own charts, make your own skits, make your own songs up for whatever it is that you're teaching. Come up with some games that would illustrate the lesson. Make your own pictures. Take your own pictures. Draw your own pictures. Get a whiteboard, a chalkboard, or some type of a, a poster board, or maybe an easel with a flip chart, and draw on it. I'll never forget when I first began to preach. Uh, my father uh, was sitting on the platform, and he had asked me to preach, and he said, now you're going to preach tonight, son. I said, okay. I got my sermon ready, sitting on the platform. I'm just about to go up and preach. And a special music is going on, and somebody's singing a special 
My dad leans over and he says to me, Now, son, tonight, don't bore me. Don't bore me. I said, Well, you know, that's a real vote of confidence, Dad. I appreciate it. So I preached my sermon. Uh, he asked me to preach a few weeks later. He was doing Sunday mornings at the time. I was doing Sunday evenings then. We were co-pastoring together. Got up right before I got ready to preach. He leaned over and he said, Now, mix it up a little bit tonight, would you? Don't bore me. And I thought to myself, Well, how are you going to preach a sermon to a preacher who's been a preacher for 30 or 40 years and not tell him something that he doesn't already know? And the answer is, you're probably not going to come up with something that he hasn't already seen or heard. But what he was saying to me is mix it up a little bit. In other words, take a text and preach from it. The next time I would start somewhere and preach down to the real text that I wanted to emphasize. One Sunday, do expository. One Sunday, do topically. One Sunday, act out part of it. One Sunday, pull an R.G. Lee and change your voice up and play part of the characters in the sermon. That's what he was saying to me. Mix it up. Make it interesting. Make it exciting for the people. Through my life, I've been in all types of churches and seen all types of preachers preach. A friend of mine, Jeff Hallmark, we used to sit in his church, and I thought he was literally going to beat the pulpit. Just It was going to splinter, I thought. One day, suddenly, he beat on it, and the top cracked in two in the middle of He was a pulpit beater. I've seen Hiles get up and stand on the pulpit, stand on the pulpit in the middle of the service. Um, I've seen Bob Smith run all the way around the pulpit, all over the stage during a sermon. I've seen Gene Wolfenbarger gallop across the platform like he was riding a horse to illustrate a point. I've seen Fred Vaught run up and down the aisle shouting while he was preaching to illustrate a point. Sunday, they said, used to take chairs off the platform and smash them and splinter them to pieces before people's eyes. I'm not saying maybe we need to be too theatrical, but I am saying this. Have some excitement in what you do. Move around, keep it lively, keep it entertaining, keep it exciting. The people will be attentive and they'll want to know, what is it that this person's trying to get across to me? I'd really like to grasp it. They sure seem to be excited about it. I would say this to you. Under the question of how can I illustrate it, if God has called you, he will equip you. If he's called you to teach, if he's called you to preach, if he's called you to stand and to try to convey a meaning to other people, then he will equip you to do that job. Now, that does not negate your part of studying and preparation and trying to present it properly, but know that the Lord will help in the delivery. How can I illustrate it? Use your talents. What are you talented at? If you're talented musically, I hate these singing preachers. They make it look so easy. They stand up and preach, and then suddenly right in the middle of their sermon just break out into a few verses of a song, perfectly on key and on pitch. I hate those guys. They make it look so easy. Uh, those of us who are not that uh, good of singers would love to have that talent because it's a way of captivating your audience by breaking into a familiar uh, 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 a phrase or a familiar verse of song that they know. Sometimes uh, I've seen preachers have the congregation sing with them or a teacher do that. Very powerful tool. If that's the talent you have, use it. If your musical ability is it, maybe you play to help illustrate or maybe you write a little song about Zacchaeus climbing up in the tree or about David with the sling to help the children understand. Be excited that God is using your talent to teach His holy word to other people. You're doing something. You're making a difference in people's lives that is not just temporal, but eternal. When teaching children, how do you illustrate it? I'll tell you what, teaching children is so much fun. Man, if you want to get the children really involved and really illustrate a point to their mind, get up and get all the kids involved in what you're teaching. If you're teaching about the fall of Jericho, then you get all those kids to stand up and you tell them that table is Jericho and everybody get in line and we're going to march around the walls of Jericho together. And when you march around that seventh day, seventh... Now, nobody can say a word those first six days. Shh, kids, be quiet. We're going to march around in total silence. And everybody in town is going to wonder what we're doing. And you march around those walls of Jericho six times. Then on the seventh day, you tell them now nobody say a word until I tell you to shout. And then we're going to shout. And then you march around seventh and then have them all shout. Boy, you talk about remember the lesson. They'll never forget Jericho if you illustrate it like that. 
You say, what about other lessons? Well, what about Gideon as he fights the Midianites? You take those children up to the rim of the canyon. Shh, everybody be quiet. There are the Midianites down there. Now, does everybody have your, your light? Yes, we've got our torches. Okay. Do you have your pitcher? Yes, we've got our pitcher. Do you have your ram's horns? Yes, we've got them. Okay, be quiet now. You go up there, you go up there, you go up there. Now, when I give the word, everybody smash those pitchers and shout, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Say what, those kids will never forget Gideon if you'll help them act it out in class. I've been teaching before as we came to Mount Sinai and I said, now let's all be Moses. We're going to approach the burning bush this morning. Now everyone, untie your shoes and take off your shoes. We're, we're standing before God now. He speaks out of the bush. This is holy ground. And all the kids pulled off their shoes and we stacked them over there. And I said, now kids, why are we taking our shoes off? They said, because God's there in the bush and this is holy ground. They never forgot that. I bet... Some years later, we could come to those same children and ask them, why do you take off your shoes when you get before God's place? They say, it's holy ground. God's there. They'll never forget a lesson properly illustrated. By way of conclusion to this portion of our teaching now, you want to leave your student with a clear understanding of the material. That's the bottom line. Not, look how great of a sermon or look how great of a lesson I delivered. The real proof, as we say, is in the tasting of the pudding. Real proof's in the pudding. Students, did you learn the material? Do you understand it? Could you give it back to me? Testing is just a process whereby the student says, yes, teacher, I got what you gave out. Here, I'll give it back to you by way of a test. Did your students, did those you were teaching really leave with an understanding of your presentation. That third definition we read a moment ago says that to understand is to believe something to be true, which means to me that when students leave my classroom or when my members or visitors of my church leave the congregation and go out to their home that morning, one way I can judge how good a job I did as a preacher or as a teacher is this. When they left, did they believe what I was saying? Not only did they grasp it, but did they leave believing the same thing that I believed? In other words, did I present it so powerfully and so clearly and so simplistically to them that when they left, they said, you know, I believe in a literal creation too. I mean, it just made sense for the first time and I really understand how God spoke the worlds into existence. I'll tell you what, if your pupils or those you're teaching leave the room and not only understand it, but they believe what you said to be true, you have really accomplished something in your teaching. When they leave, they should believe. Now, there's one other thing, and we'll talk more about the Holy Spirit in a moment. It's this. When they leave, the power of the Holy Spirit should confirm to their heart and to their mind, yes, what that teacher said or what the preacher said was the truth. When they walk out of the classroom door or out of the uh, church door, those who have been taught by you should in their mind say, the Holy Spirit bore witness with my spirit this morning that that thing that I received from the preacher, that was truth. He told me the truth this morning. Several verses clarify this for us. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In this lesson, we've learned what does the Bible say? What does it mean? How can I present it with authority? How can I apply it to those I am teaching? And how can I illustrate it so they will not forget it? In our next lesson, we shall look at fundamentals of teaching the Bible. In these fundamentals, we will go point by point through them. Fundamentals of teaching the Bible. There are four of these fundamentals we want to look at. Four rules to be observed in teaching the Bible. Now, this may seem a little elementary to some, but I would suggest to you that this really needs to be covered. And it's this. Number one, 
the person doing the teaching must believe what they're teaching. In other words, if I'm teaching the Bible, I must believe the Bible. You say, well, that's just so elementary. I just think we could have skipped that. Never take anything for granted in this day and age. Don't ever take for granted that when you, if someone volunteers to teach a class that they actually believe it's, uh, the Bible is God's Word. They probably should be asked a simple uh, set of questions and, and maybe sign something, say, yes, I believe this, and no, I don't do that, and yes, I adhere to the doctrine that this church stands for. The first rule in the fundamentals of teaching is the teacher, and I'll put in preacher also, must believe the Bible. You must believe it's God's Word. You must believe it's inerrant. You must believe what you're teaching. There are some scriptural precedents for this. John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47 say, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Jesus said, Look, if you wouldn't believe Moses, he spoke of me, by the way, then you're not going to believe my words either. A lot of people don't understand that Old Testament. Jesus said when Moses wrote over there, he was writing about me. I mean, when Moses wrote about Joseph, you know who he was really writing about? Jesus Christ. Joseph's one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Bible. When God wrote over there of uh, finding grace, Noah found grace in God's eyes, and God remembered Noah in that wicked day, he was talking about the grace that comes through Jesus Christ and the ark of our salvation. When God spoke about Enoch and his walk with God. That was not just about Enoch, just to tell a story. That was a type of the New Testament bride and their relationship to Jesus Christ. You must believe what you read is God's Word. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 says this, For this calls also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He said, you know, I'm so thankful. He said, when we preached to you and you heard the Word of God which we taught, now this is what your pupils are going to hear from you, the Word of God. And when they hear it, here's what you want their response to be. You want them to receive it not as the Word of man, but as the Word of God. Now, the only way my congregation will receive my teaching and my preaching as the Word of God and not the Word of a man is for me to preach the Word of God and me to stand before them and preach it with such power that they know that I really believe this is God's perfect Word. If you don't believe it, God has not called you to teach it. John eight forty seven says this, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore... Hear them not, because ye are not of God. My pat answer for people when they come to me and they say, Preacher, I just don't understand anything I read. My standard first line of questioning is this. Do you know for sure that you're saved? No one will ever understand, God, un understand God's Word in depth until they have within them the Holy Spirit of God to explain it to them. They must be saved first. Now, they can't understand enough to get saved. I do believe that. You must believe what you're teaching. You can't convince others that the Bible is the Word of God if you're not convinced that it's the perfect Word of God. You can't stand and say, Now, children, we're going to teach you the truth of God's Word when you really don't believe it. You have to believe it before you can teach it. Modern Bible teachers come in many different varieties. Let me give you a few Modern Bible teachers sometimes are manuscriptulators. This is someone who believes the original manuscripts possess some magical, sacramental almost power not found in any other piece of paper. There are worshipers of man. This is the man who accepts the word and opinion of another man above the authority of the Bible. There's a relative agnostic. He thinks all translations and revisions are all relative. None is absolute truth, and no one can ever really know for sure what God meant and what God said originally. There's the pragmatic anarchist. He uses a translation because it works for him. 
He's under no real authority higher than his own opinions about the translation he uses. There's that destructive critic. That's the person who could do nothing but complain about verses and words in the Bible which he does not like and which he cannot understand. And since he doesn't agree with those verses, he complains and cuts them up and says they were translated incorrectly. I would suggest there's one other type of Bible teacher, and I call that person a Bible believer. That's the person who opens God's holy book, the man or the woman who believe the book they hold in their hands and in their laps is a perfect book, an inerrant book, an infallible book, a book that contains the words of God for me in my present age. A perfect book. It's been preserved by God for me. There are other types of teachers, and we shall look at these in our next segment.